Let's go to Isaiah 45, but before we do, I want to take you to Lismore in northern New South Wales. Isaiah 45. I'll be mainly preaching from Isaiah 45. Now let's go to Lismore. Nobody comes to Lucy Vader's rescue when she's trapped on the roof in the floods for seven hours. But then there's a stranger, Jason, who hears about the coming flood and Jason is spending the evening of February 27 securing his Lismore business. I have a business in North Lismore and I know it floods. I listen to what they say. It's going to be a moderate to a major flood. I have a flood plan and I follow the flood plan. I get everything up, well above the highest flood level ever known. Jason knows when he wakes up on the morning of the 28th of February that the flood really is bad. Even before he gets out of bed, he says, in the 2017 flood, I woke up to trillions of cars driving backwards and forwards in our street, all sticky beaking, rubbernecking. When this flood, 2022, comes along, there's absolute silence. I know instantly that's a bad flood because no one is even able to get in to Sticky Beak, to Rubberneck. Absolutely everything, he says, gets inundated. It gets destroyed. Jason has grown up in Lismore, so he knows what floods can do. And what he also now knows is that there are three donkeys in a paddock on the other side of town that will be struggling if they're not taken to higher ground. They aren't his donkeys, but he knows that they will drown without him. So he gets into his kayak and he begins to paddle towards them. Jason can't see Lucy Vader, she's an artist, but he's paddling in her direction when she sees him and she yells out. Jason has just crossed the river over near the South Lismore Bowling Club. There's a big black vacant, block, vacant plot behind Lucy's place, he says. I yell out whenever I get near a house and that's when Lucy starts yelling or hollering back. I can't see through the bushes. I can't see her house. Lucy says that at the time she realises that she is worse off than what she first thinks. But then there's this man in a single person orange kayak who appears. He looks like heaven, like gold, like goodness I say, are you the army? She has heard that the army is supposed to be on its way. Jason laughs and just says, I'm nobody and I'm going to get you off this roof. Once Jason gets into the house, he helps Lucy off the roof and make sure that she's safe in the kayak. Then Jason goes back into the house to look for Lucy's dog, Dottie. I go to the side window, but I can't smash the glass no matter how hard I try. Lucy says that I can get in through the door. This is where things get tricky. The top of the door is entirely submerged and from the Ruth's perspective, Jason, who's never been into the house before, doesn't know which room Dottie is in, only that she's in one of the bedrooms. Jason dives under the door frame into the house and eventually locates the right room. The dog is sitting on the top of a mattress and has pinned itself underneath a fan. So Dottie is dry, but the water is coming higher. Soon Dottie will be swimming, explains Jason. Jason's epic effort to save the dog is only halfway home when he has to work out how to get Dottie out the way that he has come in, under the water. I have to convince the dog to get off that dry mattress and come with me. I'm lucky, he says, that she doesn't bite me. I just have to grab her and once I drag her off the mattress and into the water and past all the floating lounges and furniture and stuff, she swims quite nicely. When we get back to the front room with a submerged door, I have to grab her and duck dive underneath the door to get her out. Jason says that Lucy is very emotional at seeing Dottie, her friend. Oh, she's crying. I think she's pretty happy. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 45. We'll come back to Jason and Lucy soon. Isaiah 45 verses 1 and 2. My first main point is about God's great rescue. No, my first main point is about God's great purpose. We'll come to the rescue soon. 
We read Isaiah 45, 1. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of, to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their armour, to open doors before him so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and will level the mountains. I'll break down gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. Who is this Cyrus? Well, just like Jason in Lismore, Cyrus is the most unlikely person to come to help in a great time of need. But Isaiah writes 150 years before there is a Cyrus. 150 years ahead of time, Isaiah brings comfort to God's people who will get carried away to Babylon. And God's great purpose is that he lets his people know even way ahead of time that he truly is God. Cyrus' work will be accomplished by God's help. This mission will be accomplished for the sake of God's people. Verse 4. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, of Israel, my chosen, I summon you, that Cyrus, by name, and bestow on you a title of honour, though you do not acknowledge me. Cyrus' work will be accomplished so that all people might know that the Lord is God. This all means that God is going to use Cyrus to put his people back in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is that place that God has chosen to be the centre of his kingdom on earth. And why did God do this? It is so that the truth about God might become known everywhere. But there is a longer purpose. God's longer great purpose is coming to Jerusalem. Jesus, the son of David, eventually comes to fulfill his mission. And it's from Jerusalem that the gospel goes out to the whole of the world. And what a wonderful response there is in verse 8 to the announcement of Cyrus's mission. Verse 8, you heavens above, rain down righteousness. Let the clouds shower it down. Let the earth open wide. Let salvation spring up. Let righteousness grow with it. I, the Lord, have created it. It's extraordinary, isn't it? Here God commands the heavens and the earth to respond in bringing forth righteousness and salvation. God's purpose is sure. Now, where else do we know about God's purpose? Well, nearly all of us in this building must know Romans 8, 28. For we know that in all things... God works for the good, Romans 8, 28. God works for the good for those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Nothing is beyond the scope of God's great purpose. Of course, there's a necessary limitation. Paul, in Romans 8, 28, is expressing a general... No, he's not expressing a general superficial optimism that everything tends for everybody's good. No. If the good, all things work together for good, if the good, which is God's aim in completed salvation, yours and mine, then it is the good of God's people who are described as those who love him. Those who love him are also described as those who have been called according to God's purpose. For their love for God is a sign and token of his prior love for them. So God has a saving purpose and it's working out exactly with the, that saving rescue or purpose, salvation. Life is not a random mess, which we sometimes looks. The worst things for God's people work for the good. Don't mistake me, I did not say of their own nature, the worst things like cancer are good, but they're part of the curse. But though they're naturally bad and evil, yet the wise overruling hand of God is disposing and making those things holy so that they're morally good for the, those who love God. Just as my watch, the wheels seem to move in the opposite ways to one another, but they all carry the movements of the watch. So. What seems to be working out badly for the godly, yet by the wonderful planning hand of God, those things all work for the good, for those who love God. The evil of affliction works for the good of the godly. It's a one heartening consideration in all afflictions that befall you and me. 
that God has a special hand in them. Instruments can't do anything unless God gives them the permission. Whoever brings an affliction or whatever brings an affliction to us, it is God who sends it. Affliction to God's people are like medicine. Out of the most poisonous drugs, God extracts the best for us. No container or vessel made of gold, it can't be made without fire. And so it's impossible that we should be made vessels of honour ready for heaven unless we're melted and refined in the furnace of affliction. Those hurtful things, those hurtful events which seem to be difficult are beneficial. At this very instant and moment of time, however troubled, downcast, depressed and despairing you may feel, all things are working now and they will continue to work for your good. This is God's great purpose. My second main point is a lot shorter. My second main point is about God's great control. It's on Isaiah 45 and verse 9. Woe to him who quarrels with his maker, to him who is but a potsherd among the potsherds on the ground. Does the clay say to the potter, what are you making? Does your work say, he had no hands? God's people can't understand about Cyrus. And they don't want to understand about Cyrus because he's a pagan. But because God's chosen way of working doesn't fit with their own ideas of what is best, they cannot rejoice in God's plan. They're trapped in what is known as small-mindedness. And God is frustrated with them. There in verse 9. Does it make any sense for clay to question the potter? And even in the next verse, for a newborn baby to question its parents, woe to him who says to his father, what have you begotten? Or to his mother, what have you brought to birth? How foolish narrow-mindedness is, and how tragic it is, for it shuts people out of delighting in God, and from the joy that should be theirs. How foolish it is not to trust our gracious Father who knows what is best for us. How wise it is to fully trust our gracious potter. His control of all things is perfect. Just as Jason is in the right place at the right time for Lucy, God times and does everything exactly right. It's often hard to move from our little ideas of trusting, but we must do this if we're to exercise the kind of faith that God requires of us. It is impossible to please our Father without trusting him. Knowing better than God is a severe problem in every age and God is rightly angered by it, but he's not put off by it. He stoutly defends his kingly freedom as creator to use anyone, even Osiris, as he pleases. There in 11, verse 11 right through to verse 13. This is what the Lord says, the Holy One of Israel and its maker, concerning things to come. Do you question me about my children or give me orders about the work of my hands? It is I who made the earth and created mankind upon it. My own hands stretched out the heavens. I marshaled their starry host. I will raise up Cyrus in my righteousness. I will make all his ways straight. He will rebuild my city and set my exiles free, but not for a price or reward, says the Lord Almighty. If we were to go 150 years ahead, what will we find? God's people are in Babylon, and then we keep going and we go to the book of Ezra, and we find exactly who is in charge in spite of himself is Cyrus, and he organises things for God's people to go back with Ezra and later on with Nehemiah. It's just incredible, isn't it? Let me go to my last main point, and this is the title of my sermon today. My last main point is about God's great rescue. Jason rescues Lucy Vader. And what an extraordinary rescue it is. Jason goes to all lengths to bring Lucy out of her terrible situation. Remember what Lucy says? Jason looked like heaven, like gold, like goodness. I don't think Lucy really believes in God at all, but that's what she found herself saying. 
Jason then makes sure that Dottie is rescued as well. And you know what this all really tells us, isn't it? That God is a God of amazing grace. He has everything in hand, even a dog trapped in a flood. And he knows exactly what each one of us needs this morning. His grace is like that. This rescue of God's people takes us this morning to one of the grandest moments in the whole book of Isaiah. Now, Isaiah is an incredible book. That's a big statement. Cyrus, Cyrus fades into the background and the whole scene is dominated by the uniqueness and the glory of the Lord who has chosen to use Cyrus. The Lord alone is God and he res his rescue is to be found in no one else. Verse 14. This is what the Lord says. The products of Egypt and the merchandise of Cush and those tall Sabaeans. They will come over to you and will be yours. They will trudge behind you, coming over to you in chains. They will bow down before you and plead with you, saying, Surely God is with you, and there is no other. There is no other God. Jerusalem, of course, stands for the people of God. The citizens of Jerusalem, but they were scattered by their enemies. But God has destined them to return. And the astounding assertion of this speech is that they will rule the world. The rich agricultural products and the other merchandise of the Nile Valley will flow to Jerusalem. And the tall Sabaeans, those inhabitants of the most remote upper regions, will come like prisoners in a victory parade, confessing that there is no God but the one who reigns in Jerusalem. Of course, this picture is, represents the, um, Egypt, represents all that is remote and exotic in the pagan world, and uh, uh, what's cultured and rich and oppressive, and all those, those are imageries or the, the imagery or those pictures are to do with money and war. What is ultimately in view is a conquest that is intensely spiritual in nature, the final triumph of the truth about God. This victory, the Lord declares, will be achieved through Jerusalem, God's people who God is soon to restore to their homeland. Isaiah's response, we've read it already in verse 15. Truly, you are a God who hides himself. We haven't read it. Truly, you are a God who hides himself, a God and saviour of Israel. All the makers of idols will be put to shame and disgraced. They will go off into disgrace together, but Israel will be saved by the Lord with an everlasting rescue, an everlasting salvation, and will never be put to shame or disgraced to ages everlasting. No one who saw the captives of Judah struggling to rebuild their shattered lives in Babylon would guess their significance. They were not a nation, scarcely even the leftovers of a nation, since all their special institutions had been destroyed. God's purposes for the present were hidden in them. But soon one day they would become visible. Soon the tables would be completely turned. Idolaters presently so powerful in Babylon would be put to shame while God's people presently weak and insignificant would be rescued with an everlasting salvation. It's something we do well to remember in our day when we are tempted to lose heart at the hiddenness of God, verse 15. Things are not always as they seem. Of course, we must be careful when we're talking about the hiddenness of God. Some people might get it the wrong way. It can suggest that God has deliberately made himself and his purposes hidden so that people are driven to seek him by superstition or occult things. Nothing could be further from the truth. However, as the Lord in this matter makes absolutely clear religious superstition in all its forms especially idolatry is inexcusable look at the last part of verse 20 ignorant are those who carry idols of wood who pray to gods that cannot rescue that cannot save why is this because god has spoken to his people with a whole bible and he's spoken clearly and truthfully, making it possible for an open and trusting relationship with himself. Verse 19. Verse 19. I have not spoken in secret from somewhere in a land of darkness. 
I've not said to Jacob's descendants, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. These words are backed up by God's words through all the prophets and all the actions of God in many, many generations, such as raising up Cyrus, and these actions confirm that God is the only God and Saviour. Verse 21, declare what is to be, present it. Let them take counsel together. Who foretold this long ago? Who declared it from the distant past? Was it not I, the Lord? And there is no God apart from me, a righteous God and a rescuer, a saviour. There is none but me. So people everywhere have been put on notice. One day they will all have to bow the knee to this Lord and confess the truth about him. Look at verse 23. By myself I have sworn, my mouth has uttered in all integrity a word that will not be revoked. Before me every knee will bow, by me every tongue will confess. This is an ultimatum that's come from God. And it's universal in its scope. All the ends of the earth. Look at verse 22. Turn to me and be rescued, be saved, all you ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. This ultimatum is intensely personal in its reference. Every knee, every tongue. There's no person misses out. But what's the benefit? Look again at verse 22. Turn to me and be saved. You and I are rescued just like Lucy Vader from terrible danger, from awful shame, and worse still, everlasting destruction. It's a picture of hell itself. It's something terrifying. But we're rescued. What sensible person would not want to be rescued from that doom? That's the benefit that's offered. Rescued. You're, you're saved. You're rescued. What's the means to that benefit? Just like Jason who rescues Lucy, the Lord Jesus rescues all who turn to him. Turn. It's not doing a lot, is it? But when you turn from, you turn to. The means is that you pin all your hopes on him. You and I must look away from everything else. You cannot be rescued if you're going to look to good works. You turn. We've had the benefit offered, the means to the benefit. Who is it that benefits? It is for everyone, verse 22. Turn to me and be saved, be rescued, all the ends of the earth. Well, as I conclude this morning, is this just something hidden away in the Old Testament? Of course it's not. Matthew 11 fits exactly with what I've just been saying in verse 22 of Isaiah 45. Matthew 11 says, Jesus' words, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. What's the benefit offered? You'll find rest for your souls. How do you get there? See the means that is. This time it is, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, just like turn. Come. Why did you come this morning? It's so simple, isn't it? You take up an invitation, you come. That's the means. Who is it that benefits? Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. Are you sick of the things that displease God, that upset and hurt him? Come, whatever other burden you have too, come. Let's pray. 
Lord Jesus, we thank you that you're here present and that you indwell your people, that you work by your Spirit. Holy Spirit, we praise you that you're the sanctifier and you're working today and you'll work tomorrow in the lives of all who know and love you. Lord Jesus, you are the Redeemer and you expect us to turn to you, to turn away from what displeases you and to find full and free forgiveness in yourself and peace instead of burdens. Oh Father, we thank you that you are our creator and you sustain the whole universe and there's not one person, not one at all, who cannot respond to your invitation as you make it to all. That There is no excuse. The invitation is open. Lord God, we know that many do not want to respond, but we pray that nobody in this building will be like that. We pray for our relatives and friends, that our witness for yourself, Lord God, will be consistent so that people will want to return. Oh Lord, do great things, just as you promised and as you did, and fulfill that promise with the people of yourself from Jerusalem and further around that went off to Babylon, you brought them back, and that you had a Cyrus to do that. Lord God, we thank you for your great care of your people, and we ask as we continue to sing your praise and, and fellowship together that you would build us up so that we're more and more like yourself, and we plead for the honour of Jesus in his name. Amen. <laughs>